and in kind of the stories that we get to hear and are being taught. Um, and the next thing I would like us, I like to ask you to treat this the next couple of hours not as a lecture as such, but as um, as a space for discussion. And hopefully the reasonings for that will become clear as soon as I start um, speaking. Um, and I would like us to have a shared and open space. So if you've got any comments or any suggestions, any questions, just do make yourselves heard and I'll stop and we can have a conversation and divert from there. Um, yeah, so I'd like this space to be for speaking with and listening with and to each other. And there's going to be quite a lot of music just playing in the background because that's what I like. Um, but if it is too loud or if you can't hear my voice, just let me know and I'll turn it down. Offer your experience as truth, said the experimental music composer, the artist and feminist Paulina Oliveros when she first met science fiction and fantasy writer Ursula Le Guin for the first time in the early spring of 1986. This sentence resonated with Le Guin. In reflection, she wrote, there was a short silence. When we start talking again, we didn't talk objectively and we didn't fight. We went back to feeling our ways into ideas using the whole intellect, not half of it. Talking to one another, which involves listening. We try to offer our experience to one another, not claiming something, offering something. Le Guin and Oliveros were able to talk in a language they both shared, a language that sought to offer something rather than claim something, a language Le Guin calls the mother tongue. For Le Guin, the mother tongue is a language of a relation, a relationship. It connects, it goes two ways, many ways, an exchange, a network. Those who speak it do not wish to divide or separate. Those who live by it do not speak at you, but with you. All of you, your body, your limbs, your ears, your eyes. The mother tongue then is a language of embodiment. It encompasses more than mere words. It includes gestures, bodily presence, movements, it connects bodies to environments. It is a language that allows bodies to listen, to experience, to be with one another and offer something rather than claim something. The mother tongue, however, is not a universal language. It sits on the peripheries, outside the centers of governance and at time it is barely heard or understood and not everyone speaks it. Although those who do, time and time, and time and time again, have been misunderstood or admitted as bad to hear, as irrational, as incomprehensible, as incognizable. The mother tongue then is one of weirdness and queerness. It operates outside the language of rationality and order, or what Ursula calls the father tongue, the language of power, of social power. The father tongue considers itself to be the universal language. Whilst it may be universal, or it may call itself as the principal form of language that organizes and sets the systems of social power, Simultaneously, it is a language of limitations. It conditions, it claims, it restrains. The father tongue is not a relation. It is not a relationship. It is not built on kinship. Quite the contrary. 
as Le Guin says, it's spoken from above and it goes one way. No answer is expected or heard. It does not speak with or listen with. Instead, it speaks at. According to Le Guin, it only lectures. The father tongue, then, is one of disconnection and disembodiment. It divides, it individuates, it excludes distances, it creates gaps. Historically, the father tongue has been a property of white men speaking at, claiming and not offering, silencing the utterances of those who, for one reason or another, would not be able to speak it of those who, for one reason or another, would fail to fit in, of those who would be willful or refuse to be silenced. Historically, women and those who identify themselves as women have been deemed as the ones failing to adapt to the father tongue. According to the feminist writer Anne Carson, women's voices have been admitted as contaminating as bad to hear since the Asian Greece. Women's sound, as Carson argues, has been damaging to the rational ears of men. It has led towards monstrosity, disorder, and death. And to avoid death, to avoid chaos, to avoid disorder, women's sound has had to be excluded from the places of decision-making. He has had, to use our Ahmed's term, to be spat out from the centers of governance, or what Carson calls the civic space of men. Those who would fail to conform to the father way of speaking would be displaced outside into, as Carson argues, the city limits, relegated to suburban areas like the mountains, the beach, the rooftops, or houses unsound, cacophonous, incomprehensible and undisciplined, female sound is bad to hear both because the quality of a woman's voice is objectionable and because women uses her voice to say what should not be said. After all, it is man's proper civic responsibility towards women to control her sound for her in so far as she cannot control it herself. After all, as Sophocles would tell us, silence is the cosmos for women. And yet, even when silenced, even when displaced, even within the peripheries, throughout history, women have continued to speak and listen with. They have turned to the mother tongue to find shelter, to share, and to listen to one another, to be bodies, and to be embodied. Okay. So in the next, hopefully less than an hour or so, I will explore the histories of experimental music and sounding arts using the mother tongue. I will willfully divert from the language of power, of social power, the father tongue, and tune towards the sounds and utterances that since the invention of the first auditory technologies such as phonograph, have been made within the peripheries, on the edges, outside institutions, performance halls, and recording studios. I will turn to voice the voices of those who have been repeatedly conditioned by the father tongue with the hope that they can be unsilenced and with the hope that a more inclusive approach to how the history is told and how the practices are accounted for can be offered. And yes, this proposition implies that the history of experimental music and sounding arts, as it continues to be told and retold, has been written using the father tongue. It has been gendered and gendering. It has been divisive. It has prioritized certain voices whilst dismissing and suspending others, including the voices of women. The history of sound in the arts, as we encounter it in the ever-increasing amount of compendia, edited books, and journals, then still one of limitations. 
It distances, it leaves gaps, it claims a very particular and narrow linearity, one that is governed by male voices. The stories and practices as narrated using the father tongue have been primarily driven by technological determinism and the potential of the machine, <clears throat> leading to rational and objective evaluations and framings of sound. These accounts have sought to claim, institutionalize, and bracket sound, consequently limiting, not opening its potential. These accounts, as a result, have left little to no room for considering the wide breadth of practices, as led by women, for example, that would aim to move beyond the techno-fetishist approaches to sound and explore orality in bodily, experiential, and socio-political terms. To give a few examples, when studying and reading about the history of experimental music and sounding arts, we are repeatedly taught that it was John Cage who conceptually rejected the idea of silence. We are also told to turn to composers such as Luigi Rosolo when thinking about noise and non-musical instruments. When listening, we are ordered to concentrate and reduce our ears, as dictated by French composer Pierre Schaeffer. When imagining sound in space, we are often, and maybe too often, referred to composers such as Edgar Varese, Yanis Sanakis, and sound artist Bernard Leitner. When engaging in the soundscapes of the world, we are directed towards sound ecologist Murray Schaeffer's thinking, as supposedly he was the first practitioner to claim the term with confidence. Female artists and composers, including Paulina Oliveros, Daphne Oram, Hildegard Westerkam, Annie Lockwood, Marianne Amateur, Alison Knowles, Maria Chavez, Judy Dunaway, and this to name a very, very, very few, and the list could go on for days and weeks, have also worked with silence, have also transformed non-musical objects into instruments, they have also written about soundscapes. And yet, their stories and explorations with and through sound continue to sit on the peripheries, on the edges, sporadically entering the center and then being spat out again. I believe that by tuning towards the mother tongue and with that yes to an extent turning our backs to the father tongue, or in other words, the language of power, the language of the institution and the patriarchy that continues to envelop the field, we can discover a more expanded and a more open story of sound, one that includes and considers the voices of those who have not had chance, to, chance or space to be included or listened to and with. The stories of those who have been previously silenced or excluded. Arriving from the mother tongue, I consider women's sound and women's work with sound a relation. A relationship that is embodied, experiential, and lived. Here then, I divert from the technologically determinist and essentialist readings of sound, that readings that have been stereotypically associated with and led by patriarchal structures, and explore how sound can and has been used by female creators to confront the universal language of power, to break the father tongue. I propose that by connecting sound to sound bodily and by embodying it, women artists have offered the experience of being with and through sound as lived and truth. Female artists have used their bodies to connect with sound and free sound to connect to other beings, things and places and times in a myriad of different ways. Using technologically mediated and naturally constructed sounds, they have imagined and saw music, they have touched sound, they have embodied what I call all sound. In that sense, here I explore sonic practices as undertaken by women artists through the dimension of the body and via body, as seen, touched, imagined, and embodied. I argue that by being a body, 
and being embodied by, with and through sound has empowered women not to claim, bracket, or reduce the listener's ears. On the contrary, it has enabled women to open and expand the spectrum of all sound. So in the following part of the talk, I will present a number of short case studies with the aim to illustrate how sound, when practiced and explored, has been seen, touched, and embodied by artists working in experimental music. And this is by no means an extensive or comprehensive account of the breadth of sonic practices that has shaped the history of experimental music, but it hopes to serve as an introductory intervention, as a step into a very much needed debate. Okay. So I begin by exploring the work of women artists <clears throat> who have experimented with the idea of making sound visible as a way of breaking the perceptual barriers between the eye, the ear, and the rest of the body, and in the broader context, the barriers between bodies and institutional walls they would be repeatedly confronted with. Liz wrote, a British artist, um, an active feminist, explored the possibility of seeing sound in her musical, um, in her visual music artworks and sound installations. Rhodes utilized the technology of film to transform sound into visible sculptures to be experienced by listeners in physical <coughs> spaces. Film served for Rhodes as an auditory instrument which she utilized as a way of expanding the listener's perception, connecting the eyes and the ears with the rest of their bodies. By using film as a musical instrument, rather than a visual medium as such, Rhodes embodied a position of an artist composer. She would transform film stock into scores, which she would compose using hand-drawn sound inscribed directly onto celluloid film, a technique called optical sound. This way, expanding the potential of the meeting and obstructing its representational nature. When working with and through sound, Rhodes believed that by interfering with the heightened visuality of film and challenging its limitations, specifically by inscribing sound into an image, a hidden sonic dimension would emerge. It would a sonic dimension that would become visible and felt in the lived space. Rhodes used this technique as a way of subverting the ideological position of the cinematic apparatus, the industrial and the mental machinery that would condition the participant's way of being with art. Rhodes' audiovisual installation, Light Music, demonstrates that seeing sound can be possible and that sound can become material and spatially shaped. When creating the artwork, clip, the artist positioned two film projectors in two different parts um, of a darkened exhibition space, with each projector facing each other. Both audiovisual machines would emit black and white minimal graphic shapes composed using the optical sound technique, hand-drawn sound onto a film celluloid technique, allowing sound and sound-induced light to slowly fill the architectures of the space. Sound, when in operation, would travel from one wall to another, interfering with the visual objects and the experiencing subjects in time this way extending itself and transforming the whole room into a pulsating sounding sculpture. 
sound as mediated through the light beams of the projectors would develop a level of three-dimensionality, which would then surround the experiencing subjects' bodies, allowing them to be in the sound and embody the sound. In that sense, when entering the gallery room, the visitors' bodies would be would inevitably become a part of the overall sounding and now visible object mediated through the projectors. This experiment aims to blur the boundaries between seeing and hearing sound. It demonstrates that a more expanded connection between what is seen and heard and felt can be possible. A connection that involves the whole body rather than just the eye or the ear. By obstructing the restrictive framing of senses, and particularly for Liz Rhodes, um, the limitations of the <coughs> film apparatus, as she saw it was guided by the father tongue, Rose refused to conform or to be reframed. She questioned what Miriam Iris Young calls her own inhibited intentionality. Rhodes, as a creator, refused to limit her bodily movements when imagining sound or making it visible, even though it would violate the order and disturb the center. As a feminist, as an active body communicating using the mother tongue, she refused to be restricted. It is by imagining sound and forming a more tactile connection to sound, as Rhodes believed, that the institutional lines could be disputed and potentially overall eradicated. As Rhode has suggested herself, it is dangerous to step out of line and lethal not to. Thus, it is possible to argue that by disturbing the cinematic regime, by expanding the synergy between sound and image, and extending audiovisuality into physical space of experience, sound for Rhodes became a material tool as well as a political engine inviting the bodies of those outside the father tongue to subvert the prescribed social lines and liberate spaces in which sound would be experienced. the um, installation setup for light music <clears throat> installation. Okay. Daphne Oram, a British electronic music composer who founded BBC Radiophonic Workshop in 1958, also pushed the possibility of imagining and visualizing any sound. The artist turned to electronic technology to explore how composers' imaginations could be extended. During the 60s, Oram developed an electronic instrument, a graphic synthesizer that was capable of transforming drawn visual material into sounds. Her optical device, the so-called the Oramics machine, became the first sonic instrument dedicated to recording and performing visual music. Whilst operating the machine, the composer would be able to draw waveforms directly onto paper and then trace them onto loops of 35 millimeter film, which would then be added to the clutch of the mechanism, this waveforming sounds. The composer's invention was groundbreaking. It allowed Oram, as the artist herself in reflection wrote, draw by hand some dozen or more patterns which will give the electronic device not only the basic complex tone colors, but also the information on how they are um, to be blended, reshaped, pitched, phrased, dynamically controlled, and reverberated. Unlike its... Um, predecessors, Oramic's machine offered, as argued by Joe Hutton, finer nuances of sound manipulation, greater flexibility, 
and simultaneity in creation of sound. Concentrated listening to composition using the aramic system reveals a more lucid, free, and at the same time a more precise analog of sound waveforms. It enabled Oram to discover, analyze, and use any hidden sounds, any sonic in-betweens that usually would be neglected or ignored or considered as the unwanted axis. Oram believed that the Oramics instrument would allow any composer or any performer to manipulate every subtle nuance of sound. As a female composer working in a predominantly male-dominant setting, Oram lacked institutional support when developing her projects. Even though Oram initiated BBC um, Radiophonic Workshop, she decided to step down and set up her own private studio. Being a woman and an artist working in electronic music for Oram was not an easy task. Not only she lacked funding or resources, but she also was under continuous pressure to justify her credibility as an electronic music composer. In recollection, Oram wrote about her visit to the BBC to discuss potential funding for her instrument. I went to see the head of research and said, I've got an idea of writing graphic music. Could I have some equipment, please? And he pulled himself back up, sorry, himself up to his full height and said, Miss Oram, we employ a hundred of musicians to make all the songs we want, thank you. And this imprinted on my mind, and I thought, you so and so, but that was the attitude. That was the official attitude they had. The BBC Symphony Orchestra, and it was there to make all the music they wanted, and nothing else was any of any interest. Despite the setbacks, the ignorance, and the gender inequality that was felt and experienced by Oram, the composer persevered and continued to develop her vision. Her tenacious and stubborn character allowed her to transform her sonic imaginations into reality. She developed an instrument that would not only extend the parameters of optical sound, but also transform how creators, when operating the machine, would connect to sound and with sound. With her invention, the composers were offered a new possible sounding world, a world where any sound could be imagined and materialized as a result. Aram's approach to sound was grounded in exploration, openness, and fluidity, not closeness. With her compositional practice and her writings about sound and technology, Aram questioned how electronically produced tones, when in contact with the composer's body, hands, the ears, and mind would inform and shape sound as imagined. And the artist thought that maybe by pursuing analogies between electronic circuits and the composing of music, we will be able to gain a little insight in what actually lies between and beyond the notes. We may be able to glimpse forces at work within the composer which seem to have counterparts in acoustics and electronics. Maybe Oram's interest in sound, specifically the in-betweens and the unknowns, the hiddens behind the notes, was led by her broader concern with the masculinity and the elitism of electronic music tradition, specifically its ability to shield the technological processes that go into shaping and creating sounds so that the bodies of those who create on the peripheries as outsiders who for one reason or another lack skills and are too daunted, bewildered and mystified by the operation of the machine will be too threatened to question or to intervene. Maybe Oram as a visionary and a radical in her field for that time wanted to confront and dismantle these gender boundaries, inviting the bodies of the creators who historically would be ignored to be daring, to imagine and to make the imaginations possible through seeing and touching sound when creating works. With Aramics, 
the instrument, the composer sought to offer the possibility for composers to expand the world of sound. An American experimental music composer and sound installation artist, Marian Amateur, also explored sound in imaginary terms. Amateur's way into sonic experimentalism was actually influenced by Stockhausen's conceptualizations of serial music, specifically his ideas around auditory spatialization. She actually studied under Stockhausen in Germany. Um, yet, she significantly developed and expanded her practice and shifted away from the authoritarian approach to electronic music production. She saw her sound practice as an ongoing expedition into bodies and spaces, a way of discovering the hidden, the lost, and the unknown. Amateur was less interested in creating technically advanced or what we call intelligent musical works and was more concerned with the experiential aspects of sound. For example, how sound um, connects to bodies and how bodies connect to sound, how sound influences the environments and how bodies respond to the environments in which things and um, events become audible. According to the artist, certain sounds are to be perceived in the sonic world becomes as important as the sounds themselves. In that sense, unlike Stockhausen, she did not want the technology to form a formal relationship to sound as such. Instead, she was interested in the process the process of hearing and making, and the subjectivities that would potentially arise from experiencing electronically produced tones. With her installations, the artist utilized technology as a tool of creating imaginary landscapes. Using a range of psychoacoustic technologies and techniques, or what she referred to as the third ear music, Amateur constructed spatial illusions for sound. With later works, including site-specific installations such as Music for Sound Joint Rooms and Mini Sound Series, the artist pushed the question of bodily listening even further. She imagined the listeners not as passive subjects, but as active producers of sonic environments capable of creating their own compositions mediated by bodily sounds, as well as the sounds discovered in the surrounding spaces. Amateur was particularly interested in exploring the idea of ear as composer, questioning whether ears were capable of emitting their own sound and what perceptual modes they could trigger. She believed that inner bodily sound was as important in shaping oral architecture as the acoustic information, such as frequencies, tone colors, and rhythms. Amateur referred to this psychoacoustic phenomenon as ear tone response, otherwise known as autoacoustic emissions, through which she explored how cochlea would not only perceive sound, but also produce sound as emitted by the ear with or without acoustic stimuli. By creating and experiencing computer-generated audible tones, Amateur aimed to activate the subject's bodies, allowing the ear to surface as a sounding instrument capable of producing its own tones in time. The composer's works arose from her personal subject-led experience of sound, and I think that's quite important to point out. She would embody the sound produced and then call it her truth. In her text, Psychoacoustic Phenomenon and Musical Composition, for example, the artist discusses the importance of building sonic knowledge and sonic understanding through experimentation 
and experience first. She writes, The observations originate directly from my experience, sonically and perceptually. It is important to understand that since I was able to work with electronically produced sound, it was possible for me to make these discoveries. And she underlines herself experientially before considering how I would develop them musically. I had unrestricted time to observe what I was experiencing. It was through her individual subjective experience, the experience as embodied and lived, that the artist was able to discover that her ears were not only receiving sounds, but also emitting them. She chose to use her experience as truth when discovering her ears speak. And then she writes, even though I knew this was happening, lacking any musical theories that explore such vivid ear tone responses, I had to question them to a certain degree. How accurately, how to accurately describe these effects? Could they just perhaps be illusions? Hallucinatory phenomena? Even though amateurs' initial findings of autoacoustic emissions were admitted as pseudoscientific by the field, lacking scientific research and knowledge, the artist persevered to experience, to question this psychoacoustic phenomenon and use it as a conceptual material when creating her works. She writes, I continued, however, over the years to develop my music, exploring such sonic perceptual responses as described in the text, because these features were fully audible and present to me and my experience. In that sense, even though her voice and her way of thinking with and through sound was diminished by the institution of art and science, Amateur refused to stop. She continued to use her experience as a way of pushing the boundaries of musical composition and explore its potential effects on bodies. Seeing sound Seeing sound, imagining sound, thinking with and through sound, whether it is through audiovisual abstraction, visual sound sculptures, optical sound instruments, has empowered women, artists working with sound and technology to oppose the masculine way of sonic thinking and sonic practice. Approaching sound something that is lived and felt rather than something that is always already given or claimed has enabled them to move away from the rationalist um, ideals from the objective organizations of sound toward more tactile and embodied explorations led by experience of the world and their bodies. Rather than calling for ontological readings of sound, experimental female music composers responded to their lived environments, which were clearly contingent upon the technological, scientific, institutional, economic, and social political systems. For them, the lived materialities of the world would inform their hearing, their ability of being, their ability of listening and practicing sound. Whilst Rhodes, Orem and Amateur utilized images, light and hand-built technological material to imagine and extend the sonic spectrum, other artists, including Alison Knowles and Judy Dunaway, relied on their tactile and embodied sonic experiences of material, everyday objects to inform them about the social, political, technological, and ecological relations to sound, sorry, to our world. They turned to the sphere of the non-musical, such as food, balloons, paper, objects that are stereotypically associated with subjectivity, emotion, and the so-called soft forms of knowledge the traditionally feminized objects. For them, the non-musical everyday things became a way of mediating and amplifying the bodies and voices, as well as the bodies and voices of those oppressed and excluded. Um, Judy Dunaway, 
an American-born conceptual sound artist and composer, has been using latex balloons as one of her main instruments for composing music and constructing improvised performances since the 1980s. Inspired by the Fluxus tradition, as well as John Cage's um, work, Dunaway's artworks and writing have extended their tradition and shifted towards a deeper engagement with politics and activism, specifically through feminist theory and queer studies. Latest, latex objects for Dunaway have not served only as compositional tools, but also as political statements through which the issues of gender inequality, um, gender, gender normativism, and anti-feminism would be put into question. Her thinking with and through sound, in that sense, became a way of raising awareness about the marginalization of certain communities and its labor conditions, including the rights of LGBT and sex workers. Dunaway's compositions could be considered as embodied explorations of the material struggles as well as the inexpressible emotional pain that has haunted the bodies of those who, for one reason or another, have been pushed out from the ordinary social systems. Excuse me. Yeah. Can I just clap that? Is that a latex blowing in order to represent um, sex workers? Well, specifically, the latex balloon in Jadaway's practice was it, used... It, no, I just wanted to ask if it was latex balloon. Yes, just yes. Like, okay. yes. Uh, that was her kind of embodied response to the AIDS crisis because during the yeah, 80s... Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. okay. She lost quite a lot of her peers um, to the AIDS illness, and that's how she picked up the latex as a material. Um, okay. Is there anything else that you want to add or ask about that? No, I just wanted to clarify that in your book. So whilst composing or performing, the artist uses balloons as reeds, consequently, consequently forming a very tactile and a physical connection to the material used. Through inhaling and exhaling the balloons, Dunaway induces vibrations into the air according to her mouth movement. The sound, as produced by the instrument, then forms loud and dissonant noises which echoes and resonates across the performance space, inducing a sense of both comfort as well as distress. On the one hand, the audible tones emitting from the balloons create a feeling of empowerment and liberation, whilst on the other, the dissonance of the sonic material produced also induces a feeling of disquietude, as if the noises emitted from latex balloons attempt to obstruct or interfere with the restrained way of being. Dunaway's work then is inherently political. By approaching sound using non-musical objects, including latex balloons, without restrictions or taboos, and transforming them into instruments, she forms what she calls a non-judgmental oral relationship, an expanded relation, a connection between the listening bodies and the sound produced, consequently initiating a more inclusive way of being with and through sound. In her manifesto, Dunaway explains, creating a large body of work for balloons has allowed me to develop a vocabulary outside the realm of oppressive classical heritage. It has raised the ordinary and the mundane to the status of high art. I have fetishized the simple cheap toy in my music, as the violin has been fetishized for centuries by Western European influenced composers. In an era where the progress towards a woman's control of her own body is threatened, I have coupled myself to a musical instrument that expresses sensuality, sexuality, and humanity without inhibition. In the last section, I would like to address um, 
the idea of embodying all sound for Paulina Oliveros. For Paulina Oliveros, all sound. what she calls the sonosphere, all sounds that can be perceived by humans, animals, plants, trees and machines, gave her faith. Oliveros, as a strong advocate of female composers, dedicated her artistic and conceptual and political life to exploring more expansive approaches to listening, shifting away from sonic determinism and the militancy of organized sound towards more open sonic spheres, led by improvisation and experience. Oliveros developed a methodology for engaging in all possible sound, which she called deep listening. The purpose of deep listening was to motivate personal and social consciousness with the hope that the bodies of those who, for one reason or another, have been excluded from sound making and listening practices, who would feel more at home, who would feel more at home when making and participating in sound. Whilst the notion of all sound was already echoing in composer John Cage's practice, um, Paulina Oliveros' reading of this particular concept differed from Cage's conceptualizations. For Oliveros, all sound was based on social inclusion and interconnectedness, whilst Cage's approach sought to musicalize and institutionalize every possible sound. When questioning silence, Cage claimed that sound surrounds and guides us at all times, that it is impossible to exist in silence, something that he discovered after entering an anechoic chamber at Harvard University. By suggesting that there was no such thing as silence, Cage, as media theorist Douglas Kahn suggests, institutionalized and framed all sound. All sound became a form of musical instrumentation to be performed in institutional performance settings. Olivera's approach, however, was different. As an active feminist, she engaged in all possible sounds of the world as a way of breaking down institutional walls and gendered lines, a tool for allowing all bodies, and not <coughs> only male bodies, to form a bodily connection to their listening environments. For Oliveros, listening and sound making were inherently political and social acts. By performing, writing, and thinking with and through sound, all sound, the composer was committing, committed to raising consciousness, fighting for women's composers' rights, and questioning the roles of gender. Even when rejected or excluded, the artist has continued to persevere. She writes, I've had to bang my head against the wall. I talk a lot about these issues. Everyone has to be involved in changing it. Or else, it just does not get changed. It means that music has to be taught differently. It has to be inclusive. By opening her ears and her body to all sound, the insignificant, the buried, the disguised, the excluded, Oliveros took a political step and confronted this eerie silence that was conditioning her body. She discovered that if we listen globally and through global forms of listening, there was more power. It offered a more expanded connection between the bodies and the audible world and the lived world. And they were able, according to Oliveros, to heighten and expand consciousness of sound in many dimensions of awareness and attentional dynamics as humanly possible. Oliveros developed deep listening practice by physically placing and engaging her body in the world of sound. In order to arrive to her truth, she experienced and experimented with sound first, again. She continued to do so until her very last breath. In Deep Listening, a composer sound practice, she writes, 
My performances as an improvising composer are especially informed by deep listening practice. I do practice what I preach. When I arrive on stage, I am listening and expanding to the whole of the space and time continuum of perceptible sound. I have no preconceived ideas. In the sense where she's saying, I'm not there to claim, I'm there to open up and offer with others in terms of what I experience. The composer used various musical instruments, including accordion, electronic devices, as points of departure, departure for entering the deep listening states. Oliveros expressed the necessity of participating and listening as a deep practice. For her, deep has to do with complexity and boundaries, or edges ordinary or habitual understandings. Deep coupled with listening or deep listening is learning to expand the perception of sounds to include the whole space-time continuum of sound, encountering the vastness and the complexities as much as possible. With each session, Oliveros would expose her whole body to the sonic environment, embody it. She would be a body and then she would reflect on the experience of being a body. The exercises would involve, she says, energy work, body work, breathing exercises, vocalizing, listening and dream work. This work, as Oliveros believed, would liberate bodies and expand the listener's consciousness and on social political level, as Polyveros explains, deep listening would facilitate compassion and a more open understanding of one another. New fields of thought can be opened and the individual may be expanded and find opportunity to connect in new ways to communities of interest. Practice enhances openness. Practice enhances openness. This process of practicing and opening up to all sound has enabled Oliveros to develop a vocabulary to describe the sounds that kept returning to her as she listened and as she experienced. She believed that there was richness in auditory phenomena and it was endless. And immersing in all sound would allow us to access what she calls its treasures. Oliveros, when granting her body to resonate consciously with the oralizations of the world, discovered a full vocabulary to be spoken in bodily terms, spoken the mother tongue. The list, as Oliveros claims, needs to grow and expand. It needs to be included. It needs to enter the center. So for a second, let us return to the moment when the feminist writer Ursula Le Guin and experimental music composer Paulina Oliveros met each other for the first time. The moment when they decided not to talk objectively at each other but instead listen to and with one another. By allowing her ears as well as the whole bodies to engage in the world of sound that was surrounding them and the bodily presence at that time, from background noises, bodily movements, to the language they both shared and understood, Le Guin and Oliveros were able to offer the experience to one another as truth. Their truth, as they continue to be in each other's presence, would not try to assert or claim something, but instead offer something. In other words, the truth was not conditioned by prescribed or predetermined forms of knowledge. Instead, it emerged from intersubjective encounter with each other. Their truth, in that sense, was embodied. Le Guin and Oliveros, when listening and talking to and with one another, allowed themselves to be subjective, to be embodied, to be a body, 
offering something that emerged from becoming a social body. This precise something that is offered and not claim is able to discover the most hidden and concealed sonic in-betweens that are usually ignored, discounted or neglected. The sonic something is all sound. The gaps and the cracks in the speech, the quiet moments between the speaker and the spoken to, the space and time between the sound emitted and the sound perceived, the unwanted noises which, when dictated by somebody, has become abandoned. The sonic potential of the in-between is an endless one, and its vastness became audible and felt when Oliveras and Le Guin met each other and listened to one another. The beating of one's heart, the hiss of the microphone, the sound of traffic, the auditory stillness of a silent room, this restlessness of one's inner speech, all of these events, all of these sonic events, and many more, whether they were intentional, expected, or deemed as redundant, contributed towards the offering, that offering of something. As also Le Guin points out, in order to offer something, a body must overcome the limitations of the dichotomies and divisions, nature, culture, subject, object. It must allow itself to engage in it all, and it should feel confident about being vulnerable and viable when not knowing what it is that it is experiencing. Yeah. Okay, so... As Le Guin points out, in order to be able to offer something, a body must overcome the limitations of dichotomies and divisions. So the limitations of placing things and experiences into dualisms, um, such as nature, culture, and subject and object, and it must allow itself to engage in it all. The body should feel confident about being vulnerable and viable when not knowing what it is that the body is experiencing. If we let the ears to be orientated and directed, if we allow the objective to take over, then the in-betweens get lost, then we are able to offer less. As Oliveras tells us, when we control our ears and we become focal listeners, we become subjected to power and authority. All sound, and by all sound I mean everything that is audible to the human ear and body, from noise to music, from one's heartbeat to the sound of wind, has the capacity of liberating and expanding the listening's, listener's perception. It enables the listener to be embodied and to be a body. So this talk sought to explore the in-betweens and the hidden and the silenced. Whilst, as I said to begin with, um, it was by no means a comprehensive account of the diverse histories that has shaped and continues to shape the culture of sound, it has sought to serve as a step towards a silencing, a way of open up to the multiple histories and turning a history into history, breaking away from its singular and linear narrative. It has sought to create a space for listening with and speaking with rather than speaking at. I'm not sure whether that works. It has tried to say that it is okay to be a body and to be embodied and offer your experience of the world as lived and felt as truth. It has suggested that when turning to the mother tongue, when allowing to be bodies and to be embodied, women and sound have been powerful and transformative. And we need to remember that if we refuse to be orientated or to be directed by the father tongue, then being a relation and a relationship and speaking with and listening with others that share our refusal, as Le Guin argues, we will, we will be able and it will enable us to erupt. 
she argues that we can become a mountain range. We can form a social plural, and many of us, thanks to the mother tongue. Speaking and listening with using the mother tongue, however, means speaking subversely. As this talk tried to demonstrate, the mother tongue is a form and an act of activism. It's an active act. Becoming a mountain rage, thus, is not an easy task. However, through struggle and work, we continue, we persist, and we rebel. The accounts of women's practices with and through sound, as discussed today, have attempted to showcase just that. They have expanded sound into different milieu, subverted forms, norms, and traditions. And according to Le Guin, if you're underneath, if you kept down, you break out and you subvert. We are volcanoes. When we offer our experience as truth, as human truth, all the maps change and there are new mountains. Okay, I'll stop there. So that's the end. Now, maybe let's just open up and have a discussion and hear what others have to say. Uh, yeah, just a question about um, and maybe how, how, where, and like how she's putting her stuff into practice. Sorry about who? Oliveros. Oliveros. Yeah. In what sense? Where well, where was she? You know, if she's. Yeah, okay, so her act is political, per se, in the making, but where, where was it being stayed? Okay. I mean, she would perform anywhere and everywhere. I mean, she would definitely not confine herself to a kind of classical, um, kind of performative scenarios. Um, she would deliver workshops in different community settings, she would perform outside. She would walk with people, so there was no like a s static setup for where she would um, explore and experiment. And the idea is that she developed, um, obviously, the methodology of deep listening was a way of getting others to also explore and experience their way of deep listening. So she developed a uh, a book. That was, I mean, that could be picked up by anyone and practiced by anyone in any situations. And the idea is you don't have to be a composer, you don't have to be a sound maker, so you just have to be a body and to participate in the environment and try and enhance your ability to listen and connect to the environment. Yeah. But in a sense, she was deep playing. She was deep playing. Deep playing. You know, she was producing the sound. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like collaborative in the sense of like other people and were playing with her or not. Yeah. 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 So the deep listening exercises would enter in different stages. And some of them would involve playing, some of them would just involve sitting in silence and listening. Uh, some of them would involve um, walking or like to get someone to talk. There was no really prescribed um, setup as such, but it was, if anything, most certainly a, a group exercise a lot of the times. So she wouldn't perform at people, she would perform with people. Yeah. And the idea that ev everyone who's involved in the kind of listening environment is a producer of sound. The idea of the father voice. Father voice, yeah. The band. The baddie. Yeah. It's yeah. like I'm mindful that that masculine kind of voice is constricted people in history. But I, I also wonder if the father thing has to be inherently authoritative in order to have that kind of voice. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I was back in Samoan. And also just like going back to the lived experience, which is pretty much my own experience of violent figures and you know, just thinking about that. Mm-hmm. I think at least for Laguin, the idea of the father tongue is not necessarily associated with a man, such yeah. even though historically that's been the case, but with this idea of power and the idea of authority, the idea of institution and what that institution embodies. Um, institution is constructive, uh, restricting as a, as a limitation as such. Um, and she says that everyone can talk the father tongue, and we do talk the father tongue, because that's how we operate. Um, but it is restricted, and it holds us back. So she proposes a more open way of talking, and then she goes on to talk about its mother and the mother way of speaking as a way out of it. Um, but yes, the idea is not to just kind of create another form of dualism as such, but find a way of expanding language beyond yeah. its restrictiveness. I guess I was thinking that like, that's kind of detached from actual people or like, figures and so the way speaking in any one I see that um, more clearly now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The sad reality is that we're always confronted with institutions and we're always yeah. Uh, confronted with a form of power and authority. We haven't got to a point where we can have a um, kind of a not, not judgmental, as Donna would say, or an anti hierarchical way of being together in space. And I think um, that's still a kind of discussion to continue and have. But yeah. Any other comments, insights? Yes, John. That's fantastic. Uh, I can imagine Radik fitting in really well into there. Pardon? Camp. I can imagine Elaine Radik or Western yes. Camp also having another rich chapter. I mean, there's so the, uh, many ways yeah. and entries into mm-hmm. this conversation that we could sit here for weeks yeah. doing yeah. that. Mm-hmm. I've got my right to have one poem and all of those um, anecdotes. Yeah, always good. Talking about authority. I got to Darkington in 2001, uh, for the festival one. And we, she was really generous, it's strong. Uh, she did talks, uh, concerts, everything. Uh, very, uh, after the very opening, I pulled the night, the first one at 7 in the morning. She was doing listening exercises every, every day, and I joined for the first one, I lightened up the lights, days, so that's it.